Antimicrobial Stewardship Part 2, You Hold the Solution. I'm Dr. Paul Pottinger. The goals for Part 2 of Antimicrobial Stewardship is for you to be able to define what antimicrobial stewardship is and to know the two main goals that it serves. You should be able to list five key steps that you can personally take to reduce harm due to antibiotics. And also, I want you to start your path towards a professional life as a good antimicrobial steward. If you haven't seen Part 1 of this lecture, please go back and do that now. So what's in a name? You know, we used to call it antibiotic or antimicrobial control, but doctors don't like to be controlled, and so the name changed for a while there to antimicrobial management. But that sounded a lot like something called managed care, which is kind of a failed experiment back in the 1990s. And so we finally settled on the term antimicrobial stewardship. And we like this because no one really knows what a steward is. It sounds kind of medieval. Whatever it is, it's not particularly menacing. I mean, we define a steward as a person whose responsibility it is to take care of something on behalf of somebody else. So antimicrobial stewardship, I would define it as the wise, judicious use of antimicrobials. And we do this for two primary reasons. The first, as a clinical doctor, is for you to enhance outcomes for your patient at the bedside. Antimicrobial stewardship means choosing the safest, shortest, narrowest, most effective regimen for your sick patient. Number two, there are benefits for society overall. This is what we do as public health-minded doctors. That has to do with reducing antimicrobial drug resistance, which also reduces cost, which in theory is good for our society as well. Those are the two primary goals of antimicrobial stewardship. Now, CDC has come up with the concept of reducing antibiotic-resistant bacteria through four primary domains preventing infections, diagnosing and treating them, preventing their transmission, and wisely using antimicrobials. And no exaggeration, it's a 12-step program. And no, step one is not admitting that you're powerless over your addiction to antibiotics. Preventing infections, diagnosing and treating those infections appropriately, using antibiotics wisely, and preventing transmission. They've broken down into 12 distinct steps or skills that should be part of every internal medicine pediatric, surgical, every inpatient physician in America should know how to do all of these things. Now, because we only have a little bit of time, I'm not going to go through all 12 steps. Instead, I've consolidated them into five specific things that you can do in your own practice. Concept number one, hand hygiene saves lives. This is the cornerstone of what we do in infection control. There's nothing that is as cheap and effective and good for your patients as making sure that you have clean hands. This has been studied time and again over the centuries. It was Ignaz Semmelweis who figured this out. He was an obstetrician who worked in Austria, and he realized that the women who were being delivered by his medical students were at a much higher risk of mortality due to childbed puerperal fever. And that's because he observed them going to the autopsy suite to do autopsies, these women who were dying of group B streptococcal infection, and then going back to the wards to deliver more children without any particular hand hygiene. He proved that if he could have his medical students start washing their hands, that mortality would be dramatically decreased. He actually died imprisoned in an insane asylum because no one would believe him. He was beaten to death by his guards because he would not stop talking about this. Every time you wash your hands, every patient, every time, please think of him. Soap and water is terrific, and if you've only just touched a wall or a keyboard or a computer mouse, it's perfectly fine in most circumstances to use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer instead. Antibiotic-laden soap is a different story. I don't like that stuff. But alcohol, either isopropyl or ethyl alcohol, very unlikely to lead to resistance in microbes because they are instantly fixed and killed and do not have time to evolve. Concept number two, time plus tube equals trouble. That's my axiom. What I mean by that is that there are so many foreign bodies that come into and out of our patients. Every one of them is, of course, a portal of entry for infection. You name the body cavity, we've got a tube for it. Endotracheal tubes, central venous catheters, uh, Foley catheters into the patient's bladder. These things are great. They really make things easier for us, but they are also a portal of entry, making it easy for the entry of bacteria into your patients. Have a checklist. Ask yourself, does this patient need this tube for this indication today, or can we get it out? The big three, vent-associated pneumonia, cath-associated bloodstream infection, cath-associated UTI, all dramatically reduced by reducing the duration or dwell time of those foreign bodies. Concept number three, make a diagnosis. The microbiology lab, your new best friend. Because if you can obtain a specimen in a timely fashion and send it down to the micro lab for analysis, you will ultimately be able to target that pathogen. And you'll also prove to yourself that there's actually an infection. You may not even be sure there is an infection. You're drawing a blood culture just to see if that may be there, looking in the urine, looking in the sputum. If there's predominance of one particular pathogen, trust those results 
focus your antibiotics, and de-escalate your therapy. That is concept number four, de-escalation. De-escalation is key. Let's take the example of sepsis. In sepsis, we have a critical need to cover our patients broadly. Every hour that we have a patient with sepsis, that they're not covered with the appropriate antibiotics, their mortality goes up in a very substantial way. So for a septic, critically ill patient, you must cover them broadly and well before any microbiologic test is going to come back. And so start broad, but be willing to understand that ultimately you're giving them more than they need and be willing to focus your antibiotics more narrowly once you've confirmed what the pathogen is. You've got to send stuff to the lab and you've got to trust what comes out of that lab. Use what you need, but only what you need. I want to emphasize this. The regimen that you start as a clinical doctor will very rarely be the regimen that you finish. Okay, Changing your regimen based on microbiologic results is totally good. There's a misconception out there that if you change your regimen, you're going to make things worse with respect to resistance over time. That is not true. That is not true. Number one, you're going to do less collateral damage to the other classes of germs that you don't even need to get to. Number two, the more focused the regimen, often the more impactful and effective that particular regimen will be. And the same has to do with duration. Uh, we've all been taught that we have to give long courses of antibiotics. For God's sakes, finish all your antibiotics or you're going to get into trouble. The longer we expose populations to antibiotic selective pressure, the more likely we are to see resistance. The worst thing you can possibly do is take a pill of antibiotics here or there willy-nilly. No, treat, treat hard, and stop when the infection is done. The trend that you'll see in infectious diseases literature are trials showing that often shorter courses of antibiotics are not only uh, equivalent to, but often superior to longer courses of antibiotics. That's not always true. If you have a heart valve infection, if you have a bone infection, I'm going to need to give you a long course of antibiotics. Most other diseases that are bacterial infections can usually be treated in one week or less. So we need you to break the spiral of empiricism, and here's how it goes. You come to work, you're taking care of a patient who's super sick, and you do not know what they have. You have to cover them broadly, and so you give them broad-spectrum coverage. That's exactly the right thing to do. If you then follow the five tenets that we're talking about here, the four that we've done so far, you'll be able to break the spiral. You're going to make sure that you don't transmit infections to others. You're going to get the tubes out as quick as you can. You'll get a diagnosis, and you'll trust that data out of the lab. Because if you do not, mark my words, you will select multiply drug-resistant organisms. Those organisms will then spread inevitably from one patient to the next. And by the time you come back on service the next day or the next week, you're going to say, oh, here's another guy. I don't know what this dude has, but you should see what I saw last time. It was a monster. I better treat them very broadly. You have to break this spiral of empiricism. There's no other acceptable way to move forward with respect to infectious disease medicine. And I know that it's all about perspective, so I took this picture at the trailhead of Silver Peak here in the Cascades. It says, please be aware, hunting season's open. And some smart aleck wrote with a sharpie, so's hiking season, don't shoot us. For the record, I'm a hiker, not a hunter. One landscape, two agendas, the potential for a huge catastrophe. What am I talking about? I've asked you to be great world citizens, be mindful of the environment, be mindful of microbiome, be mindful of antibiotic stewardship. And you get that. You want to do the right thing, but you're going to work at one particular hospital. And in fact, you can't even worry about the hospital because there's one sick person in front of you and you have to do right by that patient. I totally get that. I'm here to tell you that this tension between what seems to be good for the planet and what seems to be good for your patient, that is a false dichotomy. Almost always, what you do at the bedside, if it's smart, if it's right for that patient, it will be good for your hospital, and that will be good for the planet and our survival as a species. So that's concept number five. You're not alone. Please be willing to access the experts and do it early and often. You should have a very clear idea of how to get help and who to talk to. There are great resources online and in person. Online, we have the ID Society of America, which has wonderful guidelines for a whole variety of infectious diseases. I'll show you the website at the end of this lecture. In addition, every hospital has an antibiogram. That's a chart that shows you the bugs and the drugs and what their susceptibility looks like in terms of uh, your chances of getting it right with one particular drug choice over another. In addition, we have care pathways that say, syndromically, what do you do at this hospital for a patient with bloodstream infection, urinary tract infection, meningitis, etc.? And finally, there's always ID consultation. These are some of the ID fellows from my hospital just a few years ago. They're totally adorable. These are the smartest, best teachers we have in our hospital. ID consultants know all of internal medicine or pediatrics, but they also understand the immune system and how that interplays with microbes and, of course, how to dose antibiotics. Please consult them, and I think you'll be very delighted to find that they are wonderful teachers, they're warm, they're knowledgeable, and they're eager to help you make the right choice. After all, the bugs are constantly getting smarter. You have to get smarter, too. 
So that's my summary. Antibiotic resistance, absolutely yes, can be reduced via infection prevention and the prudent use of antibiotics. And I've given you these five simple strategies for how to do this. Keep your hands clean, get the tubes out, make a diagnosis, trust that diagnosis and de-escalate, and access help from the experts. If you want to learn more, we'll have interactive class sessions as part of this module where you can go through some case scenarios. But there's also this website, idsociety.org, and of course, cdc.gov slash get smart. Thank you for your attention.